Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Diane Lightfoot to the show today. Diane is the CEO of the Business Disability Forum, uh, which we do quite a lot of work with, uh, both uh, as ATOS and also internationally. So Deborah is familiar with them through the, uh, the International Labour Organization. So Diane, it's a great pleasure to have you join us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey to um, the current job and to more about BDF? Yes, of course. And thank you very much for inviting me to be on here. It is delightful to see you both. And I think it was at the ILO that Deborah and I actually met in person, wasn't it, in Geneva? So, so yeah. yeah, nice to see you again. So I have been at Business Disability Forum as CEO since February last year, which means I haven't worked it out. It means we're coming up for a year and a half. And if I say a little bit about who we are and what we do and then the sort of shaggy dog story that led to me working here. So um, Business Disability Forum is a not-for-profit membership organisation and we exist to support businesses of all shapes and sizes to get better at recruiting and retaining disabled people but also serve disabled customers. And, and that's what we do. Um, but what I also generally say is that our, our purpose is really to transform the life chances of disabled people as employees and as consumers. And that's kind of the bit where my, my personal motivation kind of, kind of comes in really. So before I joined here, I spent uh, 13 years, clearly from the age of 12, at another disability charity called United Response. Bless you for laughing. Um, and United Response is a charity that works primarily with adults with learning disabilities, profound and enduring mental health conditions and autism, but, but generally, generally speaking on the much more profound end of the disability spectrum. And I started there as Director of Communications way back in 2004. And I think it sort of grew kind of policy remit. And I got really interested in the employment services. And as is the way in organizations, certainly charities, when you express an interest in something, you kind of end up acquiring it. And I think it's true. If you've been in an organization a long time, you just kind of get stuff along the way. So at some point, I managed to find myself as the director with responsibility for supported employment services. And I just, I just think it was amazing. And seeing and meeting people, maybe with a moderate learning disability, who would have grown up with probably everyone telling them that work wasn't for them whether it was their parents, whether it was the school, all very well-meaning and that you then you'd go to special school and then you'd go and hopefully get some decent supported living in the community and maybe you'd go bowling on a Monday and you'd go to the day centre on a Tuesday or whatever it was. The idea that they could actually get a job it just, wasn't, just wasn't on the agenda. And seeing how people, maybe in their 30s, getting a job for the first time, how their lives have transformed and all the things that we take for granted around having a job. So not just the money, though clearly getting paid is a really important part of it, but the whole identity that goes with somebody saying to you, you know, what do you do? And you don't say, well, I'm, I'm a person that receives support. You say, well, I work in a shop or, or I, I work in a cafe or I am an office junior, whatever it is. And then that whole thing around social support and a lot of, a lot of stuff gets talked about in social care around circles of support and all that stuff inclusion happens naturally when people get a job obviously if it's the right job and so I just kind of thought this is this is really cool this is the best thing that we do this is the most genuine way of including people so as I hope you can tell I got quite passionate about it and eventually having been there for I guess about 12 and a half years I thought I probably should move on at some stage before they take me out in a box and I happened to have a look online and I saw the advert for Business Disability Forum CEO. And I knew BDF um, formally. I knew Susan, our founder. She'd spoken at an event for us, gosh, 10 years ago now. And I thought that really looks like my kind of ideal job. And fortunately for me, um, the board seemed to think that it was a pretty good fit from their point of view. So here I am. Excellent, great, great shaggy dog story. Um, yes, yeah, see ya. And, and I think that, that, that it really chimes with um, some of the stuff that Kate Nash has said about the sort of whole soft bigotry of low expectations yes. uh, around people with disabilities that you can't, you couldn't possibly do that. It must be so hard for you. Uh, and, you know, so, yes. so I think I think that we all really want to make people's lives 
better through being able to re realize their potential i think that's why we're all passionate and i think that's why yeah. we all get on so well is because yes. we have this shared passion yes um, but i do i mean I, I you know and i spend quite a lot of time working with with bdf in one form or another um and i and i do like the the, the work that you're doing i think it's really important that that we do help organizations to learn to be better at, at enabling people to be themselves and do good yes. stuff so, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're doing to you know some of the activities that, of of the business disability forum that help create that kind of uh enabling atmosphere within organizations and and how can organizations contribute to that mm. Gosh, that's a big question for, <laughs> a, Friday okay, for a Friday afternoon. So, well, we, as, as you know, we do, we do all sorts of things and it's great working with you too, Neil. So, so thank you for that. Um, so How we have, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I have mem members and partners and at the core of our offer, we have an advice service and our advice service provides really practical, pragmatic support to businesses. And I often ref often talk about the fact that it's kind of from the really big macro things to the micro things. So it could be somebody calling up and saying, I really want to get a decent, a barrier free recruitment process. What, you know, what, how do I go about that? Or what are your recommendations for a workplace adjustment process? It might equally be somebody saying, I've got this issue and I don't know how to tackle it. Or I've got a member of staff in my team that's just told me they've been diagnosed with bipolar for instance, how, how might I support them practically? What can, what can I do? How do I have a conversation? And a lot of what we do is about giving the line manager the confidence to have the conversation and the sort of, the sort of simple tools that they can use. Because um, one of the things that I, I tend to say, probably I say too much, is that you can have the best policies and procedures in the world, but if the line manager doesn't have the confidence to have the conversation and the employee in turn doesn't have the trust to be able to say, actually, you know what, I'm struggling a bit with this or I need this, then it just all, it all falls apart. So that's, that's kind of the heart of our offer. And then there's loads of exciting things on top of that. So some of the things that we've got going at the moment, uh, as you all know, Neil, it is coming up to 10 years of our technology task force. Uh, and technology has moved on, as you know better than I do, uh, an immense amount uh, in the last 10 years. I don't think we'd have been having this access chat conversation 10 years ago. Um, so that has been a huge driver in people coming together and really saying, OK, how can we make the best of assistive technology for disabled people at in the workforce, but also how can we make sure they're compatible with existing systems? How can we make sure that new systems, when they're procured, consider the needs of disabled people right at the heart rather than trying to retrofit? So some, some really interesting stuff there, and we'll be celebrating that at a partner reception later this month. Um, we're also, uh, this sounds very grand, starting to go global. Um, again, Neil knows about this. So kind of the heart of what we do is our disability standard which is a whole organizational framework because again we believe very very strongly that getting disability right it's not just the domain of HR or diversity and inclusion teams or worse still corporate social responsibility it's got to be something that's embedded right through the business and led from the top so we've got a tool called the disability standard that helps organizations to either self-assess or get accredited in how they're doing on that and a increasing number of our partners and members were saying this is great we can't find anything quite like this that works in other countries that we operate in so we've been doing some work to create a tool that we're launching at the um, around the diffid summit later this month that we hope will help them do just that so that's a bit of a plug and a watch this space and we're also just about to relaunch our welcoming disabled customers guide because again a, a lot of members and partners have said we really need more support for our frontline staff we really want to get it right for disabled consumers which i take as a, a, an extremely extremely positive message and then in terms of some of our themes uh sorry this is this is probably a longer answer than you wanted neil no, okay. uh, so so one of the things that we see a, a huge amount is around culture uh, and closely linked to that is the whole idea of identity and then also 
the identity of, of disabled people and whether they want to see themselves as, as disabled and therefore linking into asking for support. So we're about to launch a new kind of campaign, small c, uh, theme around identity, again at our partner reception and a podcast which is sponsored by Open Inclusion um, called Looking Beyond, I think it's called Looking Beyond the Job Title. So it's getting people to talk about their experiences of becoming disabled, seeing themselves as disabled in the hope that that will also inspire others to, to bring their whole selves to work. Yeah. I, I know Deborah's got a question She's, uh, and, and, and apologies for asking a, a long question and not expecting a long answer. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll hand yeah. over to Deborah. No, it, well, because it, you're doing so much that I, I don't think that you can answer the question in two minutes. So I, I quit, that was a really good response. And I know that here in the United States, we have looked um, at what BDF has been doing for years and looked enviously, I will tell you, because the thing that I really liked about what BDF has done is you have really, really gotten the brands, the corporate brands, to really engage, and they're the ones working with your team that are creating this really powerful, robust content. And it's something that I know that we in the United States have used many, many times, and, and we're trying to emulate what you've done um, in the UK, but I, I don't think that we have done it. I think that we still, um, in the U.S. and other parts of the world, still have a lot to learn with this uh, model that uh, Susan Scott Parker started, and you're, you know, really leading the charge now. And of course, you are already global in a lot of ways, including you are part of the International Labor Organization's Global Business Disability yep. Network. You yep. are one of the networks that are heavily engaged. And I know when we met in Geneva last year that. You know, the, the, there was, uh, I believe, 26 national networks, and there were a few that really, really, really stood out head and shoulders. You were one of them. I think um, the work that Suzanne's doing in Australia, which I know mm -hmm. you have also supported, um, it was another one. And, um, and I know you are doing a lot um, in um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, yeah. because that was another uh, group that really just stood up, even stood, stood out, even though they're relatively new to these conversations. So you talked a little bit about global, but I, I just would encourage anybody that's listening to this to don't just say, oh, they're the UK, they're not for me, because if you're a corporate brand, there's a lot that BDF can help you right now do. There's a lot of good content that they share openly, whether you're a member or not, and the work is being done by their corporate members, and I, I just, I always liked that model, Diane, and I, um, I, I just think it's something that you do need to go global, and you need to help more of these countries, including the little USA, um, <laughs> do a better job with this because here in the United States, you know, corporations are getting sued left and right over these issues and they're trying. They're trying really mm. hard. And we have wonderful groups like USBLN and NOD and NBDC that are trying to help, but sometimes it feels that. Um, Y'all really are doing um, a much better job of really bringing content that is needed to the corporate brands. Um, then, you know, I, I think there's a lot we can learn from what you are doing, I would just say. Thank you. And we're, and we're really keen to share it because for, firstly, we, we come from the basis of supporting people from at wherever they are. So very much encouraging. It's not about telling people that they're doing not the wrong thing, but it's about helping them to get better. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, if, if there's the things that we can use that are practical, our tools are generally very pragmatic. They're always, they're always um, developed for business. Um, so yeah, very happy to. And I would urge people who are interested to get in touch. We've got some global information on our website. So yes, please do. Please do have a look. Well, and um, if I had said, uh, I had texted Neil and said, I'm turning it back over to you. And then I talked over him. But so <laughs> Before we leave this topic, though, Diane, um, tell us more about what you mean going global. Because once again, I know you're working with the ILO. I know that you're working in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I know you're, you've done some work in the U.S., but would you just 
tell us a little bit more about what you mean when you say you're going global and then Neil I promise back over to you. Yep well what I mean really is supporting our global businesses because you're right we have we have an amazing list of, of global brand names who work with us and when we did our member survey last year around a third of people said that they considered themselves to be broader than the UK in their operation whether that was a truly global business like the HSBCs of this world or whether it was pan-European or whether it was working in certain overseas markets and what they were saying was they found it this was global DNI lead that they found it really very difficult to get a proper picture of how they were doing in the different uh, markets that they operate in and particularly different cultures of course different languages different laws different frameworks and all that sort of thing and so what, what we did was take our um, disability standard tool um, and, and set up a global task force which Neil is on to say how, how can we adapt this as a really practical tool that is not attempting to be the expert on everything in every country because clearly we couldn't do that and, and that's why we partner with organizations like the ILO because they absolutely do do that but how can we, we how can we get something that sort of takes this back to its essence the framework and a tool that could be applicable in all these different markets all these different scenarios but still has sufficient rigor behind it to be meaningful because what we didn't want to do was create something that was so light touch that it actually didn't really help people. So this is this is the thing that we are launching next month um, and looking at it as a, a progression and, and a maturity model, if you will. So we know going back to the technology task force that the accessibility maturity model, it's a bit of a mouthful to say, sorry, um, has been really has really caught the imagination of businesses and in, in tracking process, progress, sorry, and finding a really vis a visual indicator of how people are doing in key areas. So we wanted to take that and look at how it can be looked globally. So that's what that's what we're launching. Um, I don't have a visual on uh, on me to show you, but it will be a, a strong kind of graphical illustration that people can get a snapshot of how they're doing in all the different places, then and then bring that together as well centrally. Um, yeah, so we thought that would complement the stuff that we're doing in countries like Saudi, um, in various other places where we're doing consultancy and sort of individual packages. So. That's the plan. And we're really keen for organizations to use the tool when we launch it and feedback on it. So kind of a beta launch, if you like, so that we can check how it actually works in the field. And, and, and I can attest to the fact that it's needed working in a global organization. We're in 72 countries, 100,000 people. There's going to be great variation. And I think that the, the, the difficulty that everyone that has been involved in this has stated is that there is that variation at local level, so it's it's how much do you reduce um, without reducing the meaning to nothing? Um, because we do want to, you know, at at a head office level, we 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 want to have an impact, and and the top down approach is important when you're in a multinational company because that's where stuff comes from, and when they say jump, we say how high, and all of the rest of it because. Um, that's that's the reality of working in big global companies that, that mm. wherever wherever the center is the center does can control to a greater or lesser extent the periphery so so it's important to have this um and i think it's it's a you know it's something that we'll, we'll be wanting to to being be engaged with and remain engaged with uh, over the coming months and years i also yeah. think that we want to remain engaged with bdf because we see great value, not just in being a member of the organization, but the membership of all of the other people that are part of the organization. And it's, it really is the, the for me, the, the most important part is the forum, mm. because it's a very um, unusual thing that you have going on here because I can tell you that working in lots of other places people do not actually um, be as open as people are in BDF meetings it's it's a rare thing really. to see people being as um, open about their faults and the difficulties that they have because when I go to lots of DNI conferences and um, disability conferences everyone talks about how great they're doing <laughs> and there's no one mentioning all of the bodies under the carpet 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it's refreshing to have this kind of Chatham House rules approach yeah. that you have, because that's when you actually find resolutions to the problems because you actually, oh, well, we had that problem too, and here's how we solved it. So I think that mm. is one of the, the things of greatest value that, that I personally get out of our, out of our membership is the, the openness and the honesty. And oh, that's, that's really nice to know. Thank you. Yeah, well, we really try and give organisations a safe space to talk about this stuff because in a lot of cases, even if the theory is quite quite straightforward yeah. the practical implementation in a business of any size can be incredibly difficult and I was I was talking to uh, someone one of our members yesterday and they were talking about um, how some of the, we we kind of have got the best practice stuff but then we can also talk to them creatively about what might work practically for them so the example they were giving was a conversation finding an employee um, a quiet place to sit if they if they found a lot of noise very difficult and this particular was this particular organization that just wasn't possible but the solution that we jointly worked through together was let's buy a really decent pair of noise um, cancelling headphones and that and that worked for that employee but it was it was that kind of creative problem solving together and understanding where it was coming from but also what the practical limitations were that I think was a really valuable process yeah yeah, and I can I can relate to that. I sat in an area next to a bean to cup coffee machine. <laughs> How long did it take before you kicked it? <laughs> it was painful, um, <laughs> especially in the mornings. Yes. Yeah, there were it. there were a couple of hours every day where you couldn't concentrate. No, I, no, I can imagine screaming and the grinding, and then the sort of spurting noises as it. Oh. It was, Dealing out hot, hot um, re reconstituted milk. Oh, that sounds, <laughs> sounds delightful. Yes, it was lovely. <laughs> um, but 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 yes, yeah, this is actually noise is a huge issue. Mm. Um, and and I think that um, actually you you know open plan environments are um, encouraged by lots of businesses because they think it's collaboration yeah the thing you know aren't we cool and by the way we've got a foosball table at the far side um, and a beanbag <laughs> yes yes oh yeah we're hip um but but then you know that's great for some people but it's it, it's not necessarily great for others and it, it, this is an area where i think mm. you know, when we're looking at neurodiverse populations that that perhaps actually there's there's a a need for good guidance for employers on on this kind of stuff definitely uh, how to make the adjustments and how to plan when they're planning buildings as well and thinking about planning space yeah definitely and um, I think so much of it is about unintended consequences so the example you give about neurodiversity um, and an open plan office is a good one and but but going beyond that the amount of companies that I've known of, not necessarily in membership, who have implemented a hot desking policy and you can't have anything. And I think, well, OK, but if you if you have autism and knowing exactly where you're sitting, I mean, not just not just if you have autism, but and it's really important for you to know exactly where you are and exactly where your things are and you have a routine that is incredibly disruptive. So working around some of those things and getting people to think about it before they go for it as you say Neil planning it is is just so important yeah yeah I I, I, I can relate to that and I'm I'm pinching I'm taking my revenge on Deborah now by pinching saying go for it and then pinching because I want to make a con um yeah I'll take your point about um autism um and particularly the, the going one beyond uh you know the hot desking even is the sort of clear desk as well mm, yeah you know, you know so where's your sense of belonging and this is yes. particularly key for you know people who are neurodiverse. It's like I've got my pictures, I've got everything lined up. Yeah, going through that disruption every day is is, is actually you know not only is it hard, uh, is difficult for them to centre, but it's anxiety inducing. So you're likely actually yeah. compounding conditions. I will hand over to you now, Deborah. Yes. I've been naughty. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that we, we're really good at doing this. So, but you know, I think it's not just uh, for people with neurodiversity. I mean, no, I think no, it is no. for all of us. We all have a sense of belonging and 
you know, there's, I think there's very few personality, there's a very small group of people that are fine working just with a clear, a clean desk with nothing. Uh, but I think most people like that connection. It makes us feel yeah. like we belong. It reminds of maybe why we're working. I, I just think, you know, there's a lot to it. I also think the point that you, you both made this uh, comment, but, and, and I, once again, sitting in the beautiful United States, um, there's a lot of ways to get in trouble in this issue. And I remember, uh, especially here in the United States, I remember one time I was speaking at a conference in Chicago, and there were many corporations in there, and somebody said, okay, I buy it. I get we should be employing people with disabilities, but where do we begin? And I was on a panel, and one of the panel members said, just go hire somebody with a disability. And I thought, okay, that sounds like such good, wise counsel, but, um, if you're a big corporate brand, a big multinational corporate brand, when do you just do anything like that? There's usually a plan, a strategy, work in this strategy. Unfortunately, I've seen this happen many, many times in that the best of intentions, the best of intentions get companies in trouble. This happens, and, and it's really a shame. Um, and I'll give an example I'll, um, mm. to a brand that I love, uh, Walt Disney World. I mean, or Walt, I should just say Disney. Um, Disney had um, a, a policy to support people with disabilities in their park. Um, some mothers in New York City figured out that they could hire people with disabilities to pose as their family members so they could shortcut the lines to let their kids, anyway, you can see so many things wrong with this. And as this was unfolding, we were like, oh, please don't behave like that. But I was thinking also, I was psychically sending messages to Disney, don't step into this, don't step into this, don't change your policy. What would they do? They change the policy to, to you know, to, to try to be respective, but it just totally backfired on them. They had parents with children with neurodiversity and autism and all this picketing them. And this was years ago, but mm. here's a brand just trying so hard to do the right thing and believe it or not, there are going to be people that can cheat around your policies. Hmm, how interesting is that? There so, always will be. There <laughs> always, always, will always. Be. And there's just so many ways that your brand can get in trouble. Your there's just so many ways you can get in trouble, and and sometimes they're not even logical. You know, I remember a story about uh, this was years ago. One of the one of our bank branches in Tampa, Florida, a man came in and he wanted access to his wife's account. Um, they asked him to do a thumbprint to prove that he was who he said he was and he didn't have any arms. Oh, how mean is this bank? It went on our news or uh, Good Morning America type news the next day and this bank was there with their hat in their hand going, oh no, no, we really do like people with disabilities. And I thought, okay, I'm confused about this story. I have gone to branches in the United States for years, and nobody has ever asked me to give a thumbprint, ever. I mean, on my iPhone, I do a thumbprint to unlock my phone, but I've, I've never been asking a bank in the United States or anywhere else in the world to, as my only form of identification to be biometrics, my thumbprint. And also, okay, he wants access to his wife's account. Well, that does, just because I'm married to you doesn't mean you get access to my account. You have to be on my... So there was some illogicalness about the story, but what a great story. You know, mm. this big, bad bank in America is not giving this poor man with a disability that doesn't have a thumb access to his wife's account, even if there's no logic associated with it. As you can see, it's a really wonderful story. Uh, and so, but brands have to still, in that situation... No, 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 we are so sorry. We do care about that. So I think an organization like BDF, the thing that's so powerful about the work that you're doing in the UK and also abroad is that you're making sure that the corporations really have a voice. So you have someone like Neil who has shown global leadership for ATOS. I think ATOS is so lucky to have Neil, just my personal yes. opinion. Completely but, agree. Yeah, yeah they're so lucky. <laughs> 
that's right. <laughs> well, and speaking of credit cards, you've got wonderful people like Barclays Bank that's just doing an amazing thing, and Lloyd's, and we're seeing such interesting progress happening in the UK, and people sometimes will ask me, who do you think's doing it the best in the world? And I always have to give a nod to the UK. I'm not saying the UK has nailed it. There's lots to work out. This is moving. We're, mm -hmm. we're individuals. Technology's moving so fast, but the thing that I do like about the model is that the work that is really being done are people in corporations that are actually, that they have these jobs and they have to deal with these problems all day long. They have to, you know, how do you take an organization, a corporation like ATOS um, that has 200,000 employees and make sure that it's fully, oh, I'm sorry, I promoted it. Okay. 100,000 100, is pretty good too, but yeah. Make sure that everybody is is um, making sure that people with disabilities are welcome in your workforce. Everything's accessible. Every project that goes out is accessible. I mean, think about the sheer volume of the numbers yeah. of what has to be solved. So corporations need to be involved with organizations like BDF and also from the perspective of a global conversation like the ILO, Global Business Disability mm -hmm. Network. And, and I think... Um, I'd like to see more U.S. firms um, join the ILO. I, I'd like to see more of our, like the U.S. BLN, I'd like to see them join the national network. Mm -hmm. But I think there's such an opportunity to show leadership, not only to the corporations, but also to the other national networks that know their culture, they know their country, and that's what I'm seeing that BDF is doing, and I just really applaud those efforts. Why, Diane, is this a priority for you? Why is this a priority for the BDF to make sure that all of us know what to do around the world, not just in the UK? Because that's what it looks like from where I'm sitting. Yeah. Well, and increase, increasingly we are, well, this, is, this conversation is a brilliant example. We are working globally. We're talking and communicating globally. And that, so it needs to work for disabled people just as much as non-disabled people. And that cuts across every single business, every single sector. So, you know, it, it just seems very logical to me. And going back to your story about uh, the man trying to access a bank account in, in Tampa, um, you know, I mentioned that we are updating our customer guide. I had this really interesting conversation with a, a supermarket a while back, and we were talking about a fee some feedback they, they'd had um, that guide dogs, assistance dogs, had, had, had are occasionally still refused by people at this supermarket's branches. And somebody around the table said, I, I refuse to believe that nobody knows what an assistance dog is. And then I said, well... If you're in your first job or if you're in such an entry level job that you've been given the most basic instruction and, and you've been told you must never, ever, ever let an animal in and you're not given the kind of license to be creative and problem solve and be flexible that probably all three of us and probably all your listeners kind of are just used to that we can say, well, of course, if you don't have hands, if you don't have thumbs, and of course there will be a different way. But if you've been told that's what you do, and that person hasn't then been given kind of permission to be flexible, to be creative, that's when you end up with a mess. And that's why getting it down through the line managers is so important, I think. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. And and it's it's about culture because it's yeah. culture that permeates through. Thank yep. you very much. It's been a, a, a wonderful half hour. We've you know, it has. I uh, need to thank Barclays for helping us uh, keeping the lights on and uh, making sure that we're we're still here four years on almost. Um, it's been it's been a fun ride. Um, we look forward to you joining us on Twitter on Tuesday. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you. Pleasure. And Diane, did, before you jump off, mm -hmm. um, did